All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dylan Mercier. I'm with Master Library, and today we're going to be doing another NGFM webinar in regards to the importance of standardizing your EFR data. Um, we have a really neat feature that's getting ready to hit the market here in the near future, and it's called EFR Standard Feeds. Now, what makes that unique is it starts to get everybody categorizing their data in the same format, calling things by the same terms, and really allowing that data to be standardized and allowing the users to make the most out of it. So we're going to be taking a brief walk through what does data standardization mean? Um, why is it a long-term investment? and benefits and use cases once your data is properly organized. So we're really going to kind of get into um, what is it, how are you going to use it, and then what are your benefits going to be. Um, some you're going to see right away. Uh, some are definitely going to take a serious amount of time before you really start to see the real world benefits of it. So what does it mean? So the importance of tracking it down that way is that the standard fields allow you to track it for the lifetime of an asset. Make sure that all your data is in the right place, um, that you're not worried about losing it or having it disorganized in a fashion that you're not able to actually find it when you actually need it. Um, it helps lay down a common language across your contractors, across folks within your own district, um, even across your own staff members. Um, lots of folks, depending on where they came from and what kind of background and training they have, uh, they're going to have a tendency to call either different assets or even different data points associated with that asset by a unique name based off of how they were trained to call it. Um, so really kind of getting everybody playing by the same sheet of music is going to give you guys some real long-term benefits. Um, it also gets contractors calling it the same thing. It becomes much more important if you're gathering or harvesting construction closeout information. Um, this is going to allow the contractors to log this data directly into your system, um, either by allowing them access or getting them to insert all the data into an import spreadsheet. Um, depending on the comfort level with your contractor, either way really works to get that information into the system. Uh, it helps you understand the important pieces of data that you should be collecting by asset type. So what we've done is we've gone through and depending on uh, the different asset type or category that it may fall in, we have a bunch of unique data fields based on what that asset use. Um, we'll get a little more into that uh, later in the episode here. Um, there are a lot of existing data standards that have been out there for many, many years. Uh, master format, uniformat, COBE standards. Um, a lot of them are starting to get fairly dated. Uh, there's minimal reference to networking, IP connections, MAC addresses, really a lot of that technology-based data points um, just don't exist in some of those older standards. And also they were typically built out in such a fashion that the amount of information that they're requesting is so massive and there's no way to really turn on and off those fields that uh, a lot of people just get overwhelmed with it and don't really log that data properly. Um, it winds up getting disorganized. Um, individual data points could get lost in the sea of fields that they're trying to get you to capture and you just start to lose a lot of the value in it. So EFR standard asset information exchange. Uh, we have a little clip of it over here, just a screenshot. Uh, we'll get into a little more detail of it here on one of the next slides, but it takes the, the best pieces of information from the different standards. We kind of tried to roll them into one. Um, we break it into three overall categories, your physical data points, um, which are typically the things that are uh, directly related to an asset, make, model, serial, um, really the, the basic information, description of it, uh, the area that it's located in, um, things like that. And then the budgetary side. To me, I think that's one of the most valuable ones to a district and it gets often overlooked. Um, if you properly log in all of your financial information, <clears throat> both 
what it costs you new out of the box. Uh, you can associate installation costs, maintenance, uh, warranty, time and date, um, maintenance plans that you may have associated with it, uh, how long it's gonna last for, and what the expected cost is to replace that same asset, whether it's 10, 15, 20 years down the road, um, with inflation, um, with the cost of goods and materials typically rising over a couple percent each year, um, it really allows you to see that bigger picture and help you plan a budget of what's coming over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, once you start looking at what's going to fail in what group of five years, um, it can help you start producing a uh, long-term budget that's tied to actual assets in your building, not just generalizations. And then last but not least is the technical information. Um, this gets really nitty gritty on some pieces of equipment. Um, what kind of fuel does it use? Um, what's the IP address, MAC address, cable ID that it's connected to? Um, what electrical connection is provided to it? What breaker panel it's fed from? Uh, single phase, three phase, um, what's the amp draw of a particular piece of equipment? Um, all of that can be in there. And then there's also just a general notes section. Um, I mean, you can attach uh, blower tests, um, inspection results, um, old POs, uh, maintenance logs, work orders, all of that can be tracked against that asset in one place. Uh, it's a lot more user friendly. Uh, we also offer the ability for users, school districts, end users to request additional asset types or fields to be standardized against an asset type. Um, Self-admittedly, nobody's perfect. After this uh, process was designed, there's an understanding that different facilities will have potentially unique data points that need to be tracked for own internal reasons. Um, once a couple to a few districts or end users start to request similar data points. Um, those can get reviewed by a EFR standards team. And if it's determined that there's a common use case across multiple districts, there's a potential that that gets added into the standard. Um, a newsletter or notification will be sent out and everybody will be able to utilize and leverage that additional asset type or data point really allows the standard to remain flexible over years and uh, adapt to new data points, uh, new pieces of equipment as they get brought into uh, the facilities. So EFR standard fields within ML work orders. Um, so standard fields is a um, standard that could be utilized by really anybody. Um, it's open source. It could be downloaded from efrstandards.org. Um, but we have chosen to incorporate that into our ML work order system. So we already have uh, 175 plus asset types, new ones that are getting added all the time. Um, we're actually looking at probably close to a dozen that are going to be added in the near future here. Um, it's always evolving, always changing to best help our clients. Um, the data will soon be able to connect to capital planning tools. Now, this has been an important one that clients have been asking for for quite some time now. Um, it really allows this data that when you start to load in all your budgetary information, the financials associated with each of these assets, it can automatically push to the next step in the system, a capital planning tool to really help show those budgets, uh, visualize the costs that are associated with them, and help your team make better decisions. Um, in one of our previous webinars, we talked about the five Ds, data, drawings, documents, dollars. All of that rolls together to help you make better decisions. And really filling in all of the data points within these standard fields will help you build out most of these Ds. Um, the capital planning tool is coming at the end of 2021. Um, obviously that's coming up real soon here. Uh, we'll be bringing in uh, the client soon to test this live, uh, working out any additional features that need to be in there. And uh, you guys should see this available to your districts uh, sometime in the near future. Really excited to get this one out into the user's hands. So here's a screenshot. And actually, I'm going to uh, jump to a live site here and pull this open. So this just shows um, all the 
different standard field data points that uh, we're really able to get into um, that allows you guys to track against. So here's kind of the general information um, that we talked about. Area served, what building it's in, general description, asset name, um, it's associated with a life safety system. Um, that's a big one when it comes into commissioning some of this equipment and understanding what it needs to be tested against. Um, so for instance, this one here, we're looking at uh, an access control panel within a building, uh, happens to be the one for the admin building main entrance. Uh, we're able to have a, description of where it's located uh, the ceiling near the double doors uh, it tells you what PR what network equipment room that the power supply is located in and uh, a brief note that anybody that's looking to interact with that has to see the facilities manager for fob edits um, you can leave other notes like that that will just help users know who to talk to when they need edits or time changes or troubleshooting um, we have the make, model, and serial. Those are all located in there. Uh, the service company of who actually maintains this piece of equipment. Uh, that's very helpful if you have a failure and potentially the person that knows who typically maintains or troubleshoots this equipment is out for a day or a prolonged period of time. Um, having that data at your fingertips will help you quickly resolve a, uh, a troubleshoot issue. Uh, you can track the status of an asset, whether it's in use, whether it's retired, uh, whether it's on hold, um, the space that it's located in, and the vendor if it's anybody different than the service company. The financial information. Now, this is, like I said, what I feel is one of the more powerful pieces. Uh, this is also a lot of the data that will port directly into the financial planning tool. Um, estimated replacement date. Useful life, those kind of go hand in hand uh, with installation date. Um, purchase date is often different than install. And sometimes that um, changes based on the warranty cycle. Um, some warranties, as we know, are based off of when an asset is purchased. And other warranties are based off of when they're put into use. Um, sometimes that can be a fairly significant amount of time from one to the next. Um, so being careful to track both of those will help you get the most out of your warranties. Um, purchase order, uh, having that referenceable so that it could be searched uh, is always a good one to have. Uh, the replacement value uh, calculates in inflation, um, rising cost of goods, and really helps you see what that's gonna cost to replace at the end of its useful life. Uh, the IT related, this is, like I said, one that kind of sets us apart. Uh, a lot of the other standards have fallen behind with some of the IT related uh, data points. They're just not available on a lot of those other formats. So uh, if it's an addressable system, you can see the address, um, cable ID. This is likely a CAT6 or CAT6A that goes back to the TR. Uh, we got the TR designation, the patch panel, and then the port number. Uh, these are typical standard cabling nomenclature there will help you identify where this is connected quickly that will definitely assist with troubleshooting time. Uh, the MAC address of the device and the IP address that helps again with online troubleshooting. Um, if somebody needs to connect locally via the network to be able to upload or download cards, uh, event history, uh, a lot of times if there's a network failure or configuration issue, uh, the MAC address and IP are very important to be able to track down that information and uh, directly log into a device to do uh, an event pull or configuration update. Um, we also have the switch and port that it's connected to within the rack. So this one in particular connected to switch number two, port 41. So you should very easily be able to identify the TR you need to go to the switch you need to go to and the port that it's connected to. Um, it's very important to have, especially in the days of managed network equipment. Um, if a configuration gets lost or updated or you need to adjust the VLAN that something's communicating over, um, you can do that easily when you have this information at your fingertips. Uh, PoE power. Uh, more and more devices these days are being powered by PoE switches. As the power allotment goes 
higher and higher. It allows us to power um, more intricate pieces of equipment and hardware via PoE switches. Um, I mean, they're even starting to get lighting systems where each individual light or strings of lights in a room are all connected via PoE. Um, and this would be a very powerful tool to be able to track all of that information. Um, this is some of the equipment specifications. It really gets into the hardware. Uh, what batteries go into it? Um, all these access control panels have their own local battery backup system. Um, Energy Star rated. Uh, this is a little more important in the lighting side of things and could potentially gain your facility rebates or uh, state aid, depending on what percentage of your equipment is all Energy Star rated. Uh, let's you know what circuit breaker, what distribution panel it's connected to. Um, often these breaker panels are not necessarily located in the same proximity of the hardware. And uh, as we all know, the panel schedules are not all the time labeled perfectly. So if you really get these contractors to log that data of where it's connected and tag it against the individual asset information within the work order system, uh, you'll always have that. That way, if a panel schedule gets damaged, changed, updated, um, just not filled in, uh, you'll still have it when you go to troubleshoot this. Um, you can log recurring costs. Uh, so we put an example in here, annual maintenance, um, battery upgrades. Uh, the batteries on these panels, since they are light safety, uh, they should be changed every year on a maintenance program. So there's a $85 annual cost. Uh, this is an action that is performed internally. An outside contractor does not have to come in to do it. Typically, batteries are handled in-house uh, just to keep costs driven down. You don't have to pay to mobilize a contractor. Um, and it's typically a task that can be accomplished via the PM and procedures module within work orders as well. Um, but this just tracks any cost associated with it. And then uh, each time a work order is logged, uh, the user or really anybody that has access to it can log notes against a particular asset. Uh, we have a note that the batteries needs to be changed annually. Um, a of breadcrumbs of where the wiring runs down. Uh, some of that is very important if uh, door frames are getting changed out or something's getting relocated. Um, often that information is only in the heads of the original installer that uh, can often get lost over the years. Um, even hidden assets that can't be necessarily noticed from uh, standing on the ground or up on a ladder, if you have to start popping ceiling tiles to locate these, having those detailed notes of uh, where you can find and identify that asset uh, will save a lot of time in the field for troubleshooting. Um, so this is what a typical um, asset information when you're using the standard fields will look like. And again, based on the asset type, these are all tailored in order to keep the screen clean. So you're not going to see um, what type of fuel or gas line that something is connected to if it's an electronic device. Um, they're all very tailored um, just to keep that clean and organized. So EFR data standards, they're for the lifetime of your building. Um, sometimes it can seem like a substantial lift to get all this information logged, especially if you're starting with nothing. Um, you're starting digging through old construction projects, uh, looking at some old as builds, uh, potentially referencing old O&M manuals, um, inter staff interviews, uh, but really building out all of that information, um, even interacting with your business department, looking through old POs, logging that financial information. Once it's built, it's there for the lifetime you're building. Um, it hurts one time and it will save you time for many years to come. It's definitely a long-term investment, um, one that you got to be able to zoom out, and look at the big picture, and it makes that time investment a lot easier to swallow. Um, data portability. Once they're all standardized and you have everything in these standard fields, um, it makes it easier to move it across systems. Uh, you may have your own internal um, budgeting tool that you use. Uh, all of this data could be exported into spreadsheets and then it makes it very portable. Uh, you're not married to a single work order system and it really lets you invest in that data, spend all the time and feel really good that you're never gonna lose that investment. 
Um, it helps your team make smarter decisions, um, saves a lot of time, and it increases your management skill set. Um, diving in, doing this exercise, understanding where that information was stored, how it's organized, uh, doing a personal review of that data as it goes into the system will help make sure everything's proper, organized, and at your fingertips. Um, better reporting. Um, as this data gets logged in there, uh, we are building out a powerful visual reporting tool that will help you see um, what's coming up down the pipe for replacements. Um, it will help you produce auditing and condition reports, um, measure efficiencies and maintenance. So you'll be able to see a clear before and after of approximate or average time that was required to complete work orders and maintenance procedures on this equipment. And the goal is that as more of this information gets logged in there, uh, you see a reduction in labor time associated with some of those maintenance and troubleshooting calls. Um, asset histories that will always stay with it and consistency of data. Um, that's also important that if you're ever going to try and share this data across local districts and uh, be able to form buying groups, really having that consistency of data is necessary. Um, none of it works if there's discrepancies in naming and it becomes a mapping mess to try and make that work. Um, better planning. Um, it's easier to plan the upgrades, like I've referenced a couple of times before. You can really see what's coming down the line, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, some of these big ticket items, I mean, you could potentially be talking about um, million dollar plus overhauls on some of these systems that are nearing useful life. So often having a one, two or five year look ahead, although it's generally sufficient, Having that 10 year roadmap really helps get that long term forecasting right at your fingertips. Um, tracking the asset history, scheduling the routine maintenance, it will definitely extend the lifetime of an asset. Um, useful life of an asset that's typically found in an O&M manual, that's always best case. Um, that incorporates in all of your standard maintenance, um, making sure things are replaced, consumables are done, your filter changes, bearings are greased, all of that is maintained and taken care of um, to the best of your ability. And it definitely gives you the potential to extend an asset past its typical useful life. Um, the EFR standard fields can populate into the capital planning tool, really helps you see those visuals, helps you bring it in front of the board and potentially community members to when you're asking for some of these uh, higher dollar amounts, um, really seeing those visual reports help you um, have those conversations at a board level. Um, inventory management is one of the smaller points that uh, as you build all of this out, it gets better and better. Uh, making sure you're ordering the right replacement and consumable parts every time. When you have a make, model, and true serial number in front of you, you're ordering against definite information. Um, you're not making generalizations. Um, you're not just blind ordering bulk material because you believe it fits all of your assets. Um, helps you track your operational costs. You get to see these consumables. You get to see the recurring maintenance. Um, it reduces higher costs associated with express shipping. Um, when you know what's coming, when you know what it uses, you can make sure that you have it on hand. Um, it also helps you improve the organization and labeling of your inventory. Um, just knowing what it goes for, you can categorize it, you can rack it, you can shelf it, um, just helps keep it all organized. Um, regional buying groups. Now, this is a big one. Um, the potential for regional buying groups, if a group of facilities are using the same standard fields becomes very real. Um, just a quick, for instance, if multiple districts in an area can all identify um, a large batch of network equipment that all has a useful life or an estimated end of support or failure timeline that all falls within the same year or two years, um, it would definitely be recommended to get together, pool resources, do a bulk purchase to help drive down the cost of that equipment. Um, not only on the tech side, but this can also be done for 
large um, boiler upgrades, um, generator purchases. Um, I mean, it's really endless um, cleaning products, um, consumables, right down to pooling resources, having a common storage facility. Um, sharing the delivery costs <clears throat> will definitely help drive down costs and help with the procurement process in general. Um, it allows you to pull cross district reports. If you do so choose to share your data amongst a group of districts, um, those could always be pulled together in the common reports to help you see the possibilities for group buying efforts. Um, it's great for very small districts, especially um, some of the larger ones, they may have uh, very defined purchasing paths that they already have the volume that gets them those group discounts. But uh, a smaller one or two building district, uh, some of these rural districts that are already potentially sharing uh, sports fields, um, you know, athletic teams, sometimes auditoriums, pools, fitness centers. I mean, you already have the relationships that you're sharing some of these facilities. Why not put your heads together and uh, increase your purchasing power? Um, everybody likes a lower price and the better you plan with that, the better your odds are of driving those prices down. So in summary, EFR standard data makes your asset much more valuable and reduces operating costs into the future. Um, it leads to better reporting and decision making. It increases the opportunity to collaborate with other districts or facilities for group purchasing. That's one that I really don't want people to lose sight of because that can drastically reduce operating costs of your facility. Um, it can feed into planning tools to help you automate your budgeting process. Again, once you build these pieces of data out, you can start to forecast deep into the future and it incrementally becomes easier to load this data in on the fly as you're replacing assets in that initial lift to build it out. Once that's done, it goes into maintenance mode. Uh, the value never stops going up, but the amount of time it takes to build that data out will always go down. Um, again, that will be available on work orders um, by the end of 2021. Uh, you guys should be seeing a rollout here in the near future. Uh, look forward to seeing some notifications, emails, uh, some video demos popping up here, and uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, I, as always, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I hope this was informational for you and uh, you got some pieces of uh, info that you can use into the future. If you got any questions, feel free to reach out. My email is below. Our website there, we're always reachable. And uh, look up Next Gen Facility Manager on YouTube for uh, additional shorter content. Have a good one.